Welcome to Language During Mealtime. Certified speech-language pathologist and children's book author Becca Eisenberg brings you creative professionals from the language learning and children's education field. With these ideas, parents can help their children with special needs improve language and reading abilities. Today, I am very excited to be interviewing Allison Gerber, author of the award-winning book, Braced, and her new middle grade novel, Focused. Focused is about a girl caught between her love of chess and her ADHD. This book is a Junior Library Guild selection and has received starred reviews from Kirkus Reviews and the American Library Association's book list. She is a graduate of the New School's MFA in Writing for Children and lives in New York City with her husband and daughter. I'd like to share a quote from the book and part of my review. To view the whole review, please go to languagedurymealtime.com. Clea can't control her thoughts. She knows she has to do her homework, but she gets distracted. She knows she can't just say whatever thought comes in her head, but sometimes she can't help herself. ADHD affects girls differently than boys. This book is an ideal example of what it's like to go through a diagnosis of ADHD. Focus takes the reader on Clea's journey in working through her challenges and finding strategies and tools to improve her life. So welcome, Allison. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Well, not more, about four questions that I think that a lot of people will love to hear your input and your answers to. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you is what inspired you to write the book Focused? So thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, And thanks for all of the wonderful things you said about about my work. Um, I wrote Focused because I had undiagnosed ADHD until I was 21. Um, My brother was actually diagnosed. He's significantly younger than I am. And after his diagnosis, I put started to put the puzzle pieces together and realized that I needed to go get tested and evaluated. Um, and being diagnosed with ADHD really changed my life. It, um, it began this very long journey for me to become an author. Um, and it, it changed the way that I saw myself in, instead of thinking that I was somebody who, um, messed up all the time made tons of mistakes and was just sort of stupid. I started to understand the way my brain manages things and the way that I see the world and started to understand that every time I was messing up, it was because I was coming up against um, something in the world that wasn't working for me. And then I needed to find ways to work around it and, um, and use the the skills that I have and the tools that I have and also the sort of superpowers that come along with having ADHD to be able to navigate the world in a way that would work for me. And not having that information, sort of having not understanding myself and my own brain had really held me back from being my best self. And so um, when I wrote Focus, because I hadn't seen, I had seen books about ADHD uh, and there's a lot of conversation around ADHD. It's a it's a common term that people know and hear about. Um, but there has, but I, I realized that as I talked to people about it, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what it actually means to have ADHD and to, to have that diagnosis. Um, and I wanted to not only change that conversation and, and, um, and give people information, but to, to create a, a story and a and conflict and tension and drama around somebody who is struggling in school and struggling to figure out what why they're having such a hard time and and finding a journey to self acceptance and and there's no happy ending um, but the happy ending is learning to advocate for yourself and and that should be everyone's happy ending in a lot of ways um you know life is really a journey there are i live with adhd i'm you know i'm a 34 year old woman with adhd there are lots of i'm a mother i'm an author um it, when i'm not writing and reading i'm doing school visits i have a lot of i'm an entrepreneur in some ways and i'm balancing a lot of different things um so my i come up against my adhd constantly and I'm having to rethink the best ways to manage my own workload to um, to manage my therapy and my medicine um, and and that's just part of being a, a person is learning to see the things that 
um, that make you a really strong, capable person and things that are, that are more challenging for you. And I wanted to show that in the case of somebody with ADHD and, and create a story that really anybody can relate to. Then what I also love about the book and what you said about yourself is that, you know, the main character, Clea, really gains confidence throughout the book and she does learn to advocate for herself, which I think is, I think as a parent, it's such an important thing to teach your child to be able to advocate for themselves because as they get older, you know, they have to tell the teachers, you know, I need more time or I mean, I may need my separate location and things like that because a lot of times accommodations could be in place, but it's as a child gets older, they really need to advocate for themselves to tell the teacher, you know, that they actually need the accommodation. So, and that's true for all kids, you know, all, all people really. I mean, we all have things, whether you have ADHD or not, we all have things that we're better at and things that are harder for us. And so, you know, we have to, if you, the the sooner you learn to advocate for yourself and say, you know, this is harder for me. I need to get extra help in this. I need to go talk to my teacher in advance before the test. I need to, um, you know, maybe I need a tutor on this. The, The sooner we can recognize the things that are hard for us and learn to ask for help, even if it's in the, in the work, in the workplace. I mean, there are plenty of things. You're not going to be great at every single thing. It's really, most people aren't like that. Most people are strong in some things and some things are harder. Um, and the sooner you learn to say, you know, I need extra help in this and, and, and figure out a way to ask for it in a way that's comfortable for you, the better off you're going to be. Exactly. No, I agree with you. Cause as you get older, you're always advocating for yourself. I mean, <laughs> for me, for work, if I need, if I need help with something, I, you know, I just ask, I ask a colleague or I ask, let's say my director about what I should do. Um, so it's, it's really important. I think it's just like a lifelong skill. And then even seeing with my mother who's going through some stuff, you know, advocating for herself as well. So I think it's just a life lesson Absolutely. that, you know, you we all, we all need help in different, in different ways. And, um, and that's how we learn and that's how we become better at what we want to do. And that's how we become better people. So the interesting things that, I've realized as, you know, because I was diagnosed later and I had to sort of set up, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew sort of that I would eventually mess up. So I had to set up safety nets in place. I had to put safety nets in place so that I wouldn't fail. Um, And that has really been, what's interesting is like, that has become a huge asset for me because I'm, I, I became a big advocate for myself and not without even realizing it. And what happens when you become an advocate for yourself is you're not afraid to ask for things like, you know, I think I'm ready for that promotion. And here's, here's, um, here's a a document that I put together of all the reasons that I'm, I'm ready for the next step and that I can be an asset to your team, um, in a bigger way. And it never occurred to me that all of the years of practice of advocating for myself in the, in the, you know, to, to prevent against failure would also set me up for success in other parts of my life. Um, and I think that's the thing that, um, that's the piece of the conversation that when we talk about, um, struggles in school, we forget that those struggles are the things that actually turn you into a really strong person. And um, so if you're listening to this and you have a child who's struggling in something, in some subject, in a sport, it's that's the thing that's going to help them become the best person they can be. That's how we develop grit. And, um, and we can pick ourselves back up and try again. And, and, and it can become a hugely positive thing. And so what would you like for girls to say, you know, reading your book focus or even listening to this podcast, what would you like for them to learn from, from the book? You know, I think there's a lot to, I think there's a lot in the book. I mean, there's a lot about friendship, um, and how friendships change. And, you know, at the beginning of the book, Clea has a best friend named Red. Um, the book takes place in, in seventh grade. She's Clea is a seventh grader who lives outside of Boston. Her, um, her dad travels for work and, um, and her mom also works. She has a sister with, um, with her own challenges, a young, a much younger sister, and they have a dog. Um, and I think that, that for Clea, there's a lot to be learned about, you know, some friendships aren't meant to stay the way that they are forever and that they change and develop and people change and that's okay. It doesn't mean that there's a failure on anybody's part. Um, and that sometimes when you get older, you need different things and you need different things from different kinds of friends. So to be open-minded to, um, to how your, you might change and how the things that you need might change. Um, and I think that, you know, another 
another takeaway I think is that everybody else around you is also going through things that while you might feel like you're the only one who's struggling and having a really hard time, you're absolutely not. And I think that's one of the things that Clea comes to see by, you know, developing new friendships and, and digging deeper into the friendships that she has. She comes to see that, you know, she is struggling and she's having a hard time, but, but she's not alone in that. And I think sometimes just knowing that it kind of stinks, but it stinks for other people too, that can help us feel better. Yeah. And it's just a part of life. I mean, that sometimes we have friendships and then, you know, we just change and we, and we become different. And then, you know, you find new friendships and you may not have the same friendship you had before with that, with that other person, but you could, it's it just, it's really interesting. I, I loved how you, you know, just throughout the book about Clea's relationships with, you know, her family members, I think who are really, really supportive. And I, I really loved how you talked about her friendship with Red and how it changed and kind of how she dealt with it. I thought it was really important too, because, you know, it's so hard to deal with changes in friendship, especially if you have like that one best friend. And I, I just think it was, it, it was, there was a lot that you could take away from reading the book. Um, and I just even remember just thinking back to when I was in middle school and thinking about all the, you know, let's say the friendships that changed for me. And how hard that is, because when you're younger, you just think it's kind of the worst thing in the whole world, you well, know, and yeah, it does feel like that. Right. I mean, that's mm-hmm. I think one of the. One of the things that we tend to forget as adults is that actually like the first time that you that a friendship changes on you, it, it's horrible. I mean, you it, and it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's ever going to get better because that is your whole world. And and unlike when you're an adult and you can sort of like go meet other people at a, you know, through an extracurricular thing you do when you're in school, you know, the, the, the friend options are the people who are in your, in your grade that you see every single day. Um, and you sort of have to deal with those circumstances and the pain of that for the first time when you've never, you don't have the um, experience behind you to understand that, um, it's going to get better and it's going to be okay. Um, that somebody telling you it's going to get better and it's going to be okay doesn't help at all because the pain is so big. And so um, it just hurts so deeply because it's the first time you're experiencing it. Exactly. Exactly. So this was my daughter's question. How did you come up with the name Clea? You know, it's so, I, I was reading that question because you had sent them over. And um, I don't remember how I came up with the name Clea. Usually I have a very good sense of the, the names and um, names are very important to me. I spend a lot of time actually on the social security website, which was a recommendation that a writer friend of mine um, gave me. And I go through all the different names until I come up with names that I think are going to work for the different characters. And then sometimes I will end up changing them. I'll play around. They won't end up feeling right. Um, But Clea, I just sort of, I don't know. I I rewrote this book many times. Um, The first, so when I wrote Braced um, and I sent my agent, sent it out to editors, the feedback was that there was no plot and that nothing happened in the book. And so I added in soccer, um, which didn't exist in the first, um, in the first, version of the story. It was really a strong emotional arc without any action. And so when I wrote Focus, I knew I wanted to write a book about ADHD. I knew I wanted it to be about chess, which um, I didn't, I didn't play chess, um, but I learned how to play chess. And I just knew that this is what the book needed. So I was really excited to write a plot driven book about a girl who play, who was obsessed with chess. Um, and I handed it over to my friend, Amy, and who's an, also an author and who is very um, strong at writing plot. And, you know, we sat down, we had, um, we ordered some food and she said to me, so nothing happens in this book. Why is there no plot? And I realized that this is just how I write books, um, that I need to write the emotional arc and then add in the plot after. So, you know, I wrote many, many versions of this, of this book. Um, and Cleo was the name from the very beginning. I never changed it. And she sort of like grew onto the page. Um, but I don't have any idea where the spark came for the name. Yeah. I, yeah. Clea- I, I do love the part that you put in about the chest though. Cause I think what it shows is that a lot of the times, well, I know we were talking a little bit before about um, a lot of people have like misconceptions about ADHD and that if somebody has ADHD, it means that they can't focus on anything. And I think what I, another thing I love about the book is that 
it really talks about what people, how it's, people can sometimes misconceive certain things or assume certain things about ADHD that aren't true. And I think Clea's passion for chess is a perfect example of how you can really focus on something that you love. And she loves it. And so she just needed some help on how to structure her time so that it didn't sort of like overtake all of her time for homework and and that. But I, I do love, I do love the fact that you chose chess because I also think, you know, it's, it's not always sometimes about a sport. I mean, it could just be something like a different kind of hobby. Um, okay. And so I, I really, really love that. I love that part. Um, Thank you. So, and just like the last question, I mean, I think you kind of already talked about it, but were you a lot like Clea growing up? In some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. I mean, I think, you know, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD, so I never, um, I never sort of saw myself the way Clea is able to see herself at the end of the book. Um, I mean, I, I now can see myself that way as sort of this strong capable person who's overcome challenge. Um, but as a kid, I wasn't, I wasn't able to see that. I really, I really truly saw myself as I really felt that there was something wrong with me. Um, cause I would always mess up and that I felt like I really needed to try harder. And I think that we get some of that at the beginning of the book, that sort of urgency to succeed, that feeling like you can succeed, but then you, you, you keep messing it up and you don't know, understand why. And I think I spent most of middle school, high school and college feeling that way. Like, I, I think I can do this, but I don't know why ultimately I keep falling down. Um, and that created a lot of frustration. And frankly, you know, when you aren't, the, the biggest problem with being undiagnosed is that it starts to create mental health, um, issues. And for me, that was definitely the case. You know, I, um, I, um, I definitely had a very low self-esteem and poor sense of self and anxiety that was related to my ADHD, uh, to my, to my undiagnosed ADHD and, exactly, yeah. and underperforming. I mean, underperforming has a huge impact on how you feel about yourself. Um, I never compared myself to other people, but I was always, um, I felt like whatever was happening was not matching up to what I was capable of. And I didn't really understand it. And that created, I was definitely in Clea's angriest moments. That was that I'm shining through. Um, I would say that I was probably angrier than Clea um, on a good day. You know, there's a lot of frustration. Yeah. Well, I think it's such a good point too. And why getting diagnosed is so important and not just getting diagnosed, but also treating it on it. it in a variety of ways, you know, because she did, you know, she had, she had like, you know, medical intervention, but she also had other strategies to help her. And I think, you know, I I know for some other parents, oh, they're a little bit hesitant about it, about a label, but I think, I think what it does is that it can empower, it can empower a child, it can help advocate for themselves. And yeah, I mean, because, because anxiety definitely could become a major issue if, you know, low self-esteem. Why can't I do this? Why is this so hard for me? So it's just such an important book. And I just really commend you because you've like, to, you know, to me, you've really nailed it. I, I just, I loved it on so many different levels. So I'm just so excited to have, to be able to talk to you and for you to be able to, keep, you know, talk about your book um, because it's, it means a lot. So it's great. Thank you. Um, I also, I, I think it is like very important to sort of try to communicate to, and I hope if there are parents listening that, um, that you'll hear me out when I say that anytime you can have information about yourself, whatever that is, um, you can know who you are and the things that, that make you, um, excited, the things that make you happy, the things that make things easier for you. You know, we all have things that we all have qualities and strengths that sort of, some of them we have to work on and some of them are innate. Um, for me, I was always creative. I was always imaginative. That wasn't, of course, I work on that now in my job, but that was something that came very naturally to me. Storytelling um, always came naturally to me, but reading didn't, reading was so hard for me. And I think had someone reframed it for me and said, you know, there are all different ways to, to look at books. Um, Cause there were certain books that I was drawn to. And those were the books that were easier technically to read, but that still had, um, had exciting stories with, um, with adventures and, um, and drama like I was experiencing. And I think had somebody reframed reading for me as not a thing that you did when you were, if you were smart, it was like a smart kids thing. And I wasn't smart. So, um, I wasn't, couldn't be a reader as if they reframed it 
to, to, to make it something that um, had played on my strengths um, that maybe I would have, you know, found books as a safe space for me earlier. Um, and I think the more we can know about ourselves, the younger, the better. Um, so I understand that sort of fear of putting a label on something and all of the stigmas that come along with that. So let's work to get rid of those stigmas. Um, because the truth is that ADHD is an incredible superpower. If you can, um, if you can use it and you can understand your, your own mind. I mean, there are so many amazing qualities that, um, that come out of having ADHD and having a brain that, that, that thinks and sees things differently. Um, people with ADHD can use their hyper-focus to really become excellent at whatever thing that they're most interested in. And also people with ADHD, not across the board, everybody with ADHD is different. You meet one person with ADHD, you haven't met everybody with ADHD, but I can speak from my own experience in that, you know, my brain works really fast. And so I'm a very quick puzzle solver and I can see things differently. So when somebody presents a problem to me, I'm able to um, solve it in a way that nobody else has really thought of. Um, And that's something that's really served me well. And, you know, if you are somebody who's listening, who has a child who's um, been diagnosed with ADHD, or you think, um, or you think might need to be tested and evaluated, but you're nervous about it, um, think about all of the wonderful qualities and how, um, and how having the information to sort of help them manage and um, manage the challenges and the things that, that make school and life a little harder, um, you know, how having more information would actually help a lot. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree any, I couldn't agree more with you. So thank you so much. Cause I think, you know, what you're saying is just so empowering for, you know, just for any, let's say older kids that are listening or for parents of children who have ADHD, or even I think for family members who have other siblings that have, have ADHD as well as teachers who have those, those children in their class and how they could better support them. Because, um, it's just such an important, it's such an important issue. So thank you so much. Yeah. I, I really can't thank you enough for, and, and that's really, that's why I think it's a great time to finish up because I think ending on the positive note that it is a superpower and that, um, with ADHD, it's, you think differently and some of the most creative and most successful people have ADHD because they just, you know, you think a little bit differently and um, it, it is a superpower. So thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for having me. Don't forget to check out Allison's book, Race, as well. Go to her website, alisongerber.com. Thank you for listening. Learn with us at languagedurymealtime.com. Mm-hmm.